Hello, this is Ed Chapman, and this video cast is the first video cast for chapter 12, which is the second chapter in our unit three on cell cycling, excuse me, cell signaling in the cell cycle. Uh, these two chapters go together really well, and so I put them together into the same unit, and we'll have one test on both things combined. The first thing we're going to look at is asexual um, cell division. Okay, now before you proceed with this video cast, please make sure that you read chapter 12 and make sure you understand the main points that are going to be covered in chapter 12, which includes asexual cell division, uh, the idea of, a, idea of a cell in interphase, uh, the steps of cell division in eukaryotes called mitosis and cytokinesis, and finally the last part of the chapter which is going to be on the regulation of the cell cycle and um, how cancer develops. Now, a very famous biologist named uh, Rudolf Virchow uh, came up with an idea, omnis cellula et cellula, which means every cell from a cell. And this is the basis of the modern cell theory, which I'm hoping you're familiar with from regular biology. If you remember, the cell theory says that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Cells are the smallest units of life and all living things contain at least one cell. And the work that Virchow did led him to this statement, uh, here we have it in Latin and English, and it is very important. It's one of the, the pillars of modern biology. Uh, cells don't just spontaneously appear. Uh, they are made biogenically. They're, they're generated by cells that are pre-existing. Very important idea. Now, cells reproduce asexually for three reasons, either to reproduce the organism, uh, to grow and develop the organism or to renew or repair tissues that are breaking down or need to be repaired or replaced. Uh, anything as simple as anything um, ranging from regrowing your fingernails and your blood cells to um, you know making babies. It's all part of asexual cell division. Um, we're going to save sexual cell division or meiosis for a future unit. But before we can really get into this, we have to understand what a genome is. And it's really important that you know this word. Uh, the genome is the collection of genes that makes you, you. For example, we have human genomes, we have bird genomes, we have frog genomes, and so on. It's all the genetic information that's stored in the nucleus that is there to regulate and build all the parts of cells and regulate and organize all the different functions of cells. A very important idea. Now, the genome, of course, is located, it's stored in the nucleus of cells. So we, we're talking primarily about nuclear DNA here. Remember, there is a little bit of DNA inside of eukaryotes and, excuse me, inside of uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts, but we're just going to forget about that for right now. So we're going to be focusing in this unit on what we call the nuclear DNA or the central DNA of the cell. Now, eukaryote genomes are divided up, to, up into pieces called chromosomes. And it's not a random chop here. Uh, chromosomes each carry a specific set of genes, and there's more than one of them, and they're arranged in a line at certain locations. So genes are in a certain, certain order, and they don't normally move around. Okay, these the, the addresses or locations of each gene on a chromosome are called their loci. The, sim, the singular word for that is locus. So every gene has a locus, and every chromosome contains a certain number or a discrete set of genes. Uh, chromosomes are built from a building material called chromatin, which is actually made up of DNA and proteins associated with the, with the um, DNA. Um, every cell has a chromosome count that is characteristic of the species. Uh, you probably already know that humans normally carry 46 chromosomes in their genome. Uh, whereas something like a fruit fly carries eight chromosomes, uh, something like an Easter lily carries 204 uh, chromosomes. Uh, every species has its own number of chromosomes. I think it's kind of cool that chimpanzees have 24 uh, pair of chromosome or a total of 48 chromosomes, only two different from humans. Now, there are two types of cells inside of um of your body, for example, that are um, divided by the, their chromosome count. Somatic cells are also known as body cells, and these are the cells that have two sets of chromosomes. Uh, you got one set from your mom and one set from your dad. Uh, you also present, uh, possess gamete cells, and gamete cells have gone through a special kind of cell division called meiosis, so that they only have one set of chromosomes, and they only have one purpose. They're there for sexual reproduction. But again, we're gonna come back to them in a future unit. Now, each chromosome 
before the cell divides is made up of two sister chromatids. And we need to make sure you understand what a chromatid is. Now, chromatin in an undividing cell is uncondensed and thread-like. It's spread out, very thready. Um, it just looks dark when you put stain on it. You can't even see individual chromosomes. And during the first, um, uh, during the latter part of interphase, this DNA is replicated, which means it's copied. So after this replication is complete, the chromatin is then condensed into what we think of as chromosomes. So a chromosome is actually made of condensed chromatin. So if you look here, here's some chromatin. It's getting coiled up, and then it's getting super coiled, and then it's getting tangled even more. Uh, this is not a random process, by the way. This chromosome packing is very precise. But at its end, you end up making what we call a chromosome. So this whole thing that I'm circling here, uh, let me go ahead and circle it. Um, this whole thing is a chromosome, and you'll notice each chromosome is actually made up of two chromatids hooked together at a spot called a centromere. All right, so I've just circled one chromatid here and one chromatid here. And because one chromatid is a copy of the other, we call them sister chromatids, which means that they're exactly like each, exactly like each other. All right, uh, looks like I skipped, went the wrong way here. All right, um, here's a close-up picture of that smaller picture that I was showing earlier. Okay, and notice how tightly packed the chromatin has become by the time it's condensed into a, a chromosome. All right, here's a actual photograph of electron microscope photograph of some human chromosomes that are fully condensed. And you can see in this picture, oops, Uh, you can see in this picture that here, for example, we have a chromosome. And you can see the really faint division here between the two sister chromatids. And this will be the chromos, this, excuse me, the centromere right here. All right, sorry, I had some problem with my clicking here. All right, now, during cell division, the purpose of cell division is actually to separate these sister chromatin to get them away from each other and make sure that each of the new cells that you're building or the sister cells or the daughter cells are each containing a complete set of chromosomes. So they need to get one chromatid from each chromosome. So if you start up here at the top, we have our original cell. We duplicate each chromosome now, so each chromosome has two chromatids, and then we go through a process of mitosis to separate these. So now each of these daughter cells has one copy of, of each chromosome. So basically they end up with one chromatid. Now the confusing thing is, once these chromatids are away from each other, once they're separated, we now refer to them, to them as a chromosome. So down here, this is a chromosome just as much as the original one was a chromosome. All right, now the cell cycle is divided up into phases and the largest and most, the one that, th that the cell spends most of its time is, is a phase called interphase. All right, so interphase starts right here. This is, this is where you have a single cell and interphase goes all the way around, okay, all the way right to here, all right? So it's gonna stop right here. And interphase is broken up into three parts. The first part of interphase is called the G1 phase, or the first gap phase. And this is when the cell is growing, uh, reproducing its mitochondria, reproducing its chloroplast, if it's a plant cell, making more cytoplasm, making more ER, making more Golgi, doing all the things that a cell does to grow larger. And then, at this point right here, it starts replicating its DNA. And once the rep DNA replication process begins, we're now in another part of interphase called the S phase, or which stands for DNA synthesis. And once DNA synthesis is complete, we reach the end of the S phase of interphase, and we enter G2, which is another important part of interphase where the final arrangements, so to speak, are being made for the cell to get ready to divide. All right, so we can call that the second gap phase. It's basically a space between the end of synthesis and when mitosis actually begins. And mitosis begins right here at the end of G2, and that's when the cell goes through all the phases of mitosis that you may or may not remember, the prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase stuff. And then it divides its cytoplasm, which, which is in a part called cytokinesis. Uh, mitosis and cytokinesis frequently overlap. But the point is, by the time the cell is back to where we started, right here, we now have taken one original cell and copied it. 
All right, so we have cloned it, literally. All right, in order to move chromosomes around, the cell has to develop something called a mitotic spindle. And the mitotic spindle is fully developed in metaphase, the metaphase part of mitosis, and it's built from microtubules. Uh, you might remember microtubules from when we talked about the, um, uh, the, the um, what was it called? Uh, the architecture inside the cell, uh, what was that called? The extracellular matrix, uh, cytoskeleton. That's the word I was looking for, cytoskeleton. And microtubules are part of the cytoskeleton, and they're particularly important in cell division because what they're going to be doing is moving chromosomes and chromatids around. And there's some key words in here I want you to kind of look at and um, look them up in the textbook if you're not quite sure what I'm talking about here. Uh, first of all, each cell has centrioles which are associated with something called a centrosome. And the centrosome is where the microtubules are being organized. Okay. Now, the microtubules take a couple different forms. There are the microtubules that actually connect to the kinetic cores of the chromosomes. Now, each chromosome has a patch of protein on it, which is called the kinetic core, which is where the kinetic core microtubule is going to attach. Okay. It's kind of like a sticky place. And you also have microtubules that don't attach the chromosomes. And these are called non-kinetic core microtubules. And what they do is they just act as a bracing or a scaffolding system to kind of stretch the cell out from pole to pole during cell division. All right. And you also have some tiny little short microtubules that grow out of the centrosome here that brace the, the centrosome region against the cytoplasm, um, excuse me, against the cell membrane here on each end. All right. So this whole thing in here that is it is moving the chromosomes in the middle here during met to the middle here in metaphase are called is called this, the mitotic spindle. All right. Now here's another picture of the mitotic spindle, kind of looking at it a little bit more conceptually here, trying to get you the idea that it is actually a three dimensional structure. So if we cut the cell right through here, the mitotic um, the, the, um, the metaphase plate here, the place where all the chromosomes are lined up, would look like a circle, okay, of course, if the cell was spherical. And here's an actual micrograph picture of it. Uh, you can see the microtubules, which have stained kind of a dark gray, and the chromosomes, which are stained a really dark black here. Um, this is a micrometer right here to show how small this is. Very, very small. Now, mitosis in animal cells has six phases. Okay, well, actually it only has five. The first part here is interphase. That's when the cell is not actually dividing and it's replicating its DNA here inside the nucleus. Uh, towards the end of interphase, uh, the centriole actually duplicates itself, so you end up with two centrosomes, each with centrioles inside them. Uh, notice that the DNA is, is spread out into chromatin. All right, then we go into prophase. And the hallmarks of prophase is the chromosomes are condensing, uh, the chromatin is condensing in the visible chromosomes, and the mitotic spindle is starting to develop. The um, nuclear membrane is starting to dissolve. Now, in prometaphase, the nuclear membrane is almost completely gone. The chromosomes are fully condensed. They're starting to connect with their kinetic core microtubules, and um, everything's starting to get arranged here. Then we move to full-blown metaphase, which is when all the chromosomes are lined up at the metaphase plate in the middle. Of course, they were pushed and pulled there by the um, mitotic spindle. And then in anaphase, a very short-lived phase of, of mitosis, that's when the um, kinetic core microtubules shorten and pull the chromosomes, pull the sister chromatids away from each other. So now that we have now we have separated chromatids, we start referring to them as chromosomes. And then finally, we get to telophase, where we start reforming the new nuclei. And in the case of animal cells, we develop a split in the cytoplasm caused by a pinching in of the plasma membrane. And that's called the cleavage furrow. Right? And notice that we're reforming two new nuclei, one inside of each cell. Now, in plant cells, it's a little bit different. Plant cells don't have visible centrioles. Uh, no one's ever been able to find them. Um, their chromosomes do move around. So we have interphase, prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase. And the big difference here in telophase is for cytokinesis in plant cells, we actually get a split down the middle uh, being built by Golgi apparatus uh, called a cell plate, which is actually a new cell wall forming, forming between the two new nuclei. So no cleavage furrow in plant cells. We have something called a um, cell plate forming instead. 
Now, bacteria, of course, don't have a nucleus. So if they don't have a nucleus, they don't need to go through mitosis. They just grow larger, and then once they reach full size, they divide. And so what happens in a prokaryote cell, uh, for example, in bacteria, is they have a single loop of DNA called a nucleoid, and it just duplicates itself. It starts at one, one place and starts copying itself, and then the two copies are separated. And once the two copies are far enough away from each other, we get cleavage here, a new cell membrane building between, and finally we end up with two new cells, or two new daughter cells, exact clones of each other. <coughs> okay, we'll stop there. Thanks for listening. The next video cast will be on the regulation of the cell cycle.